Well, good morning and or good afternoon or good evening, as the case might be. Welcome or welcome back again, as the case might be. Uh, my name is Dalibor Petrovic. I'm a partner at Deloitte, and I've had a pleasure of hosting this series of live webcasts for the Canadian technology leadership audiences to both present uh, technology leaders, senior Canadian technology leaders who are really shaping the future of our country from that perspective, but also to use this channel and uh, discuss relevant topics to technology leaders, CIOs, CTOs, CDOs, and others. This is a live session, and our guests are here with us uh, live, ready to also engage. So please, if you have any comments or any questions, use the Q&A function of this Zoom platform. Today's session is going to be one of those relevant topics, not a CIO interview, but a relevant topic session. And uh, we decided to pick a topic that we know is very, very important because it consumes significant portion of every technologist's annual budget. It's rather complex, convoluted, it can seem daunting. And uh, to help us unpack this important conversation, I'm thrilled to welcome uh, my partner, Dayan Slokar. So Dayan, thank you very much. Thank for you Thank you very much for joining us. Dayan is the managing partner of Deloitte's Ecosystems and Alliances, um, which includes uh, really our relationship with uh, top uh, vendors, software providers, platform providers like SAP, Oracle, Google, AWS, Microsoft, Salesforce, ServiceNow, and others. Um, certainly the right leader to talk about the value from software licensing. And also, uh, I'm to invite uh, Garima Singh. Garima is our strategy consultant who actually worked with Dayan and the rest of the team in developing this insight and actually producing a report on software pricing models for C-suite executives, which we will be happy to share with everyone who registered after this session. So Dan, thank you very much for your time. Garima, thank you very much for your time and wisdom. Uh, let, let's start. So, so Dan, what, what was the compelling reason for you and the team to charter this, this research? Well, Dalibor, you know, uh, both of us worked extensively with our clients um, as they make decisions around significant investments in their technology landscape. Um, on the other side, we have, as you mentioned, our expansive ecosystem of relationships, of our alliances uh, that are in a business of technology enabling um, businesses and uh, creating more value uh, for our clients. And then finally, you know, in this day and age of innovation, um, we have many startup organizations, organizations that are part of other Deloitte programs that we have in place um, that are trying to find their path to success mm -hmm. and engage and create pricing models uh, for, uh, for themselves uh, to captivate the clients and client uh, audience. And when we looked at that opportunity and years of work in this space, um, um, you know, an opportunity appear to to really do something different, mm -hmm. uh, to really uh, capture perspectives of a really broad uh, audience, and um, look at how can there be more value created um, out of the um, software as a as a as a as a product, uh, the way that it's applied within organizations. Um, and the way uh, that, um, you know, optionality exists uh, to price it and uh, deploy it in uh, within the different solutions. And so with that as a back backdrop, really, we wanted to create something that informs, um, you know, this broad ecosystem uh, of our clients and alliances and startups and to start the conversation on this topic and uh, obviously bring value uh, to all of the stakeholders through that. So the report actually uh, comes at this from both angles, from the angle of software vendors to help them figure out what might be the right way to do this, but also from the consumers of software um, and, and how they should be thinking about different different models, right? 
Uh, absolutely. And uh, a part of the reason, Dalibor, for that is, um, you know, the opportunity that I mentioned that appeared is actually one of our alliance partners reached out to us. Um, they had a new product, uh, the new product offering, um, and they wanted our perspectives on, you know, how could they price this product to be uh, competitive and value based in, uh, in, uh, in the marketplace. And so through conversations with them, you know, we evolved um, to a point where we um, decided to reach out to over 50 of our clients globally um, across different markets, US, Canada, Europe, uh, uh, Pacific, uh, and Asia, and really get um, their perspectives on how do they see uh, software uh, uh, pricing models, where do they see some opportunities to uh, get more value, and what really resonates with, with our clients in that context. So whether they are CIOs, chief data officers, or you know, VP of tech generally uh, was our audience. And then on the flip side, we also engaged a number of senior Deloitte leaders that are both buyers of software for Deloitte, but also strategists in uh, in this space, helping our clients uh, think through these things. Um, and then finally, as you mentioned, you know, in addition to our client, one of our alliances that reached out. Uh, to, to to commission this piece of work, we also engaged uh, most of our uh, largest alliances in collecting their perspectives to really create something very unique yeah. that, to your point, approaches this topic both from the lens of a client as well as a software vendor. This is and this is obviously a very critical topic when we talk to CIOs. Two largest items on their budget are people and software. Like th this is gigantic parts and people are straightforward to figure out software is sometimes really really hard to stay on top so 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 maybe let's let's start at the very beginning so garima can you just maybe explain to our audiences what do we mean when we say a pricing model of course um thank you for getting us started with this question as i believe it's very crucial for us to set the level set the ground to understand what this topic what this concept is before we really get into more of technical conversation. Yep. So let me use a few consumer examples to really bring this to life. So consider how you would pay for the following, gas and electricity. So typically one is paying as per unit of energy consumed. Yeah. For video streaming services, example, Netflix, Disney Plus, you're not really paying per movie or series watched. You are paying a flat rate. And with that, you get unlimited access to their media catalog. Yeah. And let's also look at fitness classes. This is, they have become very creative with how they price themselves. So because their audience is very varied with varying needs and motivation. So you would find various pricing models there. So you could even see a flat rate uh, pricing for unlimited access to their, their facilities. One mm -hmm. could pay per visit or one could even buy consumption credits these days. So all these examples which I discussed talk about, discuss, just highlight the way these vendors are really charging for their product. And the same thing applies for software products as well. Yeah. So put it simply, a pricing model is a framework under which company charges for their product. And right. all this- and, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> no, uh, it's just closing off comment on this is, uh, a right pricing model helps the company really charge uh, extract the the most value for the product most and right. at the same time meet the customer needs yeah exactly so that's it's a balance that needs to be struck so uh obviously software industry has a variety of different models at play can you maybe share with us what are some common uh pricing models that we see in, in software industry of course um yep yeah. so in terms of um the the pricing model which exists in the industry today uh, there, there is a plethora of them. We have scattered in, in our research, we categorize them into eight main buckets. And in the industry, you would also see variations within these pricing models as well. But for the focus for this conversation, we'll just focus on these eight. Um, I'll quickly give you an overview starting from left. So the yep. first one is per user. So here, typically a software vendor would charge per individual user of the product. And variant would typically include per named user, per active user, or per concurrent user. Mm -hmm. And we see this most commonly used uh, uh, in typically how we use Microsoft Office. Yep. Second is freemium. And this is often used as an acquisition tactic to quickly gain customers. 
So uh, basically the software vendor would charge nothing for a limited basic version of the product. And if you want the additional feature, you, you pay a certain fee. Yeah. Um, third one is flat rate. I talked about it using examples of Netflix, Disney Plus. So, so same that would logic. be a Netflix example, flat rate. Yes. Consume as much as, as little as you want. Okay. Yes. And the fourth one is outcome based. And this is something which is, this is a model which is up and coming, still in very nascent stages where the individual is charged per, based on the business benefit or the value of the product. So um, such as cost saving or revenue increases. And we are increasingly seeing this use, but still very, um, still in very nascent stages. Um, the next one is consumption based. I illustrated this earlier using the gas and electricity example. So basically the companies are being charged based on actual usage. Um, and then of course there, there are multiple variants in this as well in terms of consumption bundles, subscription plus overage, or even consumption credits. Mm -hmm. The next one is per device. And this is very similar to per user, but here you get charged per device. So per laptop, per mobile hand screen. Um, so regardless of how many users might be sharing yeah. that device, it's per per Mac address or something like that. Agreed. Right. And then the next one is tiered. So here, and this is where the software vendors have started to become very creative. They they charge, they create different packages for uh, their various type of customers. So customer could select a certain feature set and pay a certain amount. And then if you want more features, you kind of pay more uh, money for that. So they, they create these specific bundles, which you can just go in and buy. And then last not but the least is the enterprise license agreement. So this is typically catered to by large vendors for a complex global customer where they give sort of an all you can eat buffet where they, the customer decide what they want to pay for, what they want to get charged for and software vendors provide that. Yeah. And, and yeah, mm -hmm. so I was gonna say it is probably in, in most medium to large size organizations, there's probably evidence of each one of these eight models in real time over hundreds of potential software products. So this is absolutely astonishingly complex, right? Totally, totally agree. All these yeah. models exist for a good reason. So they yeah. allow companies to tailor their pricing to the unique needs of their customer segments and their budgets, their norms. And it also allows them to price their product with the perceived value of the of the product through the customer. Yeah. 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 But then the CIO, who is a consumer of this and payer of this, has to deal with this incredible complexity, right? Well, totally agree. Yeah. That's exactly it, Dalibor. And really kind of tying that comment with the, what you said before, um, around complexity, around cost optimization, around rationalization, around end-to-end, uh, -end, um, you know, performance of these 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 packages, um, you know, to take maybe a different lens now after seeing what how our software providers, our alliances, think about uh, pricing. Maybe kind of take a client lens on this conversation. Yeah. And exactly as you said, you know, in the, uh, the technology is more and more embedded within business itself. You know, historically, let's say over the last 10, 20 years, we had certain parts of the business that were, uh, you know, technology enabled. But if you look at it today, the entire business processes, business functions, business models get enabled by technology. And to your point earlier, not by necessarily a single platform technology, but uh, by a different point solutions, cloud solutions, technology platforms, ERP solutions, and so on. And so uh, just a number on average, um, the the clients we engaged on average, they have upwards of a thousand different packages that you know each have a different pricing model associated with that. So then the question really becomes, you know, how do you associate that, and how do you create value and align yes. your 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 pricing to the value yeah. um, uh, that that you create? And so, you know, um, part of the uh, um, part of the insight that we got from our clients is what's really important to them is having a lens on how that how is the value created for their organization yeah, yeah. in other words any given uh business process or any given uh business function in terms of their outcome would have a certain value proposition 
And just to give an example, it can be revenue generation, it can be you know bottom line improvement, uh, improvement. it can be improvement in productivity of people um, uh, that are part of the process. Um, it can be you know improvement in experience of how customers uh, experience uh, the service or a product and therefore uh, buy more or 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 get um, you know get broader set of uh, services consumed and in many cases it can be a security or protection type of uh, you know uh, value proposition where you protect your technology your business your clients uh, from uh, from uh, the risks uh, that may be out there and so understanding that you know the core of the uh, the outcome the the, the value uh, that you are driving for then drives back decisions and alignment on well does this process enablement in a way that it is by technology that we leverage uh, is the technology pricing aligned to how we create value with this particular process and so i'll give an example um, in some cases uh, the value is created based on simply a transaction that business does yeah so um you know if if that's true then how you pay for enablement of um, that transaction for creation of the value should correspond to the value that you create. So it would indicate um, that there is a potential to do, um, you know, pricing that's based on your transaction. Um, mm -hmm. There are other situations and scenarios, and obviously this is uh, complex and involved and, you know, every client would approach a different way. But that's just one of the example how to take a, value outcome that you're after and align it and work with your partners and vendors to align it uh, to be uh, captured in your pricing model as well for the technology that you're using to enable it. Yeah, yeah. And obviously, as you said, the different pricing models are, are, are intuitively suited for different kind of styles of value generation. But what, what I'm hearing you say is that think of it from that perspective as a consumer. Think of it from where is my value created and then try to drive software vendors to to, to 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 participate in those conversations and and help you make that linkage crystal clear right yes uh, yes dalibor and you know that space uh, in based on the interviews and work that we've done uh, creating this report the opportunity to do that exists yeah um uh, you know nobody believes that there is a fine, final and the best uh, and on only one pricing model yeah. And so as a client approaching this conversation and thinking about, uh, you know, a particular area, you know, particular uh, product enablement, there's absolutely opportunity to engage with your partners and shape how that pricing model could look uh, could look for you. That's actually a really, really important and good message that that actually that's a really important message. There is that flexibility. Um, and 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 you know if you have a strong partnership and collaboration and trust and 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 uh, there is opportunity to actually have some discussions and negotiations i am sure that there are certain things that really tick people off when they deal with software pricing this is that our c suite clients have uh, regarded regarding software pricing so maybe we should uh, peek into that a little bit um what do our clients cxos actually think about software pricing Garima, can you maybe delve a little bit deeper into that? Of course, this was the one of the major part of our research. And um, there were three major takeaways for, for us from the 50 plus conversation which we had with both internal client as well as Deloitte leadership. And so the first major takeaway was uh, the client do not love pay as your good billing. And this is not, this takeaway is not really related to pricing model, but more so on the billing models. I think we should and, also take a moment to just describe the difference between yes. pricing model and billing model. Because I think many people might actually think that these two are the same, not, right? This is the precise reason we have this particular takeaway because the uh, this is one thing which became very clear from get-go that we needed to distinguish between these two concepts. So pricing model, as I said earlier, is a framework which the companies use to charge for their product. And yeah. billing model is typically when the money exchanges hands between the vendors and the customers. And uh, in, even in literature, uh, if you'd see, um, pay-as-you-go billing is often confused with consumption-based pricing, which is like uh, you get, like you pay for what you use. Yeah. So um, in terms, so, so yeah. And in fact, 90% of our clients 
during a conversation said that they really disliked receiving an invoice at the end of each month based on actual usage. And this was surprising for us, given that that's how infrastructure as a service providers build their customer today. So some of the main takeaways under, some, some of the main feedback under this takeaway were, uh, the first one is uh, definitely around predictability. The clients the, wants their software spend to be predictable. They have annual budgets. They want clarity upfront on what their annual spend is gonna look like. They don't really want bill shocks. Second, on billing model optionality. So some uh, billing model preferences really depend on the client's industry, their accounting rule, what is their cash flow situation. So some, uh, some clients would not mind paying upfront the entire amount. Some would want it to spread out to have a better cash flow situation. In fact, one of the Fortune 100 CIOs said during the interview that she was able to free up 44 million in cash flow uh, that year by not paying software vendors upfront. And uh, even though she ended up paying the same amount, her CEO was really happy because it improved their cash flow for the year. Yeah. yeah. And then um, on this, in the same vein, administration, more frequent billing, more administrative overhead. So of course, clients do not want too many billings being to be done in, in, um, in a particular cycle. And the last one on this is alignment with adoption. So regardless of billing model, clients really do not want um, to pay uh, even before the product get implemented. So they want close va value alignment between payment timing and product adoption. And this is something which they don't see in the market today. Like a lot of vendors are not doing it. They would charge you upfront. And then even though the implementation might take another six months for it to happen. Um, the second takeaway for us uh, was on that Clients are really split on the per user versus consumption-based pricing debate. So it, when we were doing this research, one, one of the trends which came about was that consumption-based pricing is on the rise. Uh, but to our surprise, clients had a mixed reaction to this model, and they tended to favor per user pricing for your large enterprise-wide software, such as ERP, CRM, or collaboration software. Um, some of the main feedback on this point were that they A, they wanted simplicity. So pricing models needs to be clear. They need to be simple in terms of how software is priced, which features are included, how new product innovation would be added. Second, uh, on the consumption base, there were mixed reaction. So some were totally against it. And for those even who favored it, they wanted close value alignment with respect to how the product was used and how they were being charged. And even if they favored it, they clients spoke about the need for strong guardrails to be in place for it to be palatable for them to uh, the, the bills for them to be palatable. So clients want wanted the vendors to tell them that what would it look like for them if they might breach their allowance, not after they have breached the allowance. Uh -huh. So so the, the, sp the spirit of transparency, the spirit the yes. spirit of please no don't surprise me. That, right. that was a, a constant theme across all their interviews. That they want, irrespective of the pricing model, they want transparency. They want the trust to be built between the vendors and the clients. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, continuing on this, uh, the next one was value metric. And this was particularly more relevant for consumption-based pricing, where client spoke about the need for an appropriate trans transaction meter, which is measurable, aligned to value, does not incentivizes the desired be uh, does not disincentivizes the right behavior. Yeah, and then um, the last two on this is per, they were okay with per user, but of course they felt this could improve in terms of uh, given that a lot of, a lot of our clients had seasonal usage. They were there was this general of employee attrition. The user type would change, so the per user pricing usually is very inflexible to accommodate all that. And then lastly on this was um, type of software matters with respect to uh, what pricing model will work for them. And this is, uh, this is in line with what Dan was talking about earlier that uh, each pricing model, each for each type of software, the client could, uh, a different type of software model could work and um, their decision on what, what type of pricing model they would want would totally depend on what type of software, uh, they're, in software they're using. And the last takeaway for us was 
on the value of partnership, subscription management, and telemetry. And um, so these gave us some additional insights on what factors clients considered when they were choosing a specific um, software or software vendor. And um, so here are three major feedback points were, first on the strategic partnership, especially large clients, uh, large global customer wants to have those few strategic vendors, highly strategic partnership with, where the vendor is very aligned to their digital transformation journey. And we have seen this manifest in terms of enterprise licensing agreements. And um, so clients really want their vend strategic vendors to succeed and they're willing to pay a fair price so that vendors can further innovate. And then the next two are subscription management telemetry. So to your point on transparency and trust, they want their vendors to help them in a transparent and transparent way, manage the subscription, be very proactive on that, and also provide them with um, the, the capabilities, the, the, um, the live usage insights, as if I may say, and, um, so that they can really, they can really see live what's happening with their how how the company is using the software how does the usage and everything looks like so yeah these were the three major takeaways of the very engaging conversations we had with very good um, yeah. our clients very good very good very good um, and uh, obviously the, the report provides further details and as I mentioned we'll share the report um, Dan um, I I know that there are some trends that are emerging on. You know how should organizations uh, think about and what they should be on the lookout for in terms of in terms of software pricing models. Maybe we can take a look into that and discuss uh, what are those key trends that you guys have observed. Yes, Dalibor, and uh, uh, absolutely. And maybe uh, to summarize them, um, you know, in three different groups. Maybe the first one. And you know, I know this is uh, this is something that's uh, near and dear to 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 a lot of uh, technologists these days. But generally, uh, AI, a uh, rise of AI, and I don't mean just generative AI, but all types of AI. Um, and why is that interesting? And um, it creates um, you know impact and a trend, changing trend within within the industry and opportunity for our clients to um, you know have these conversations and understand the impact on them as well. Um, is because when it comes to productivity, you know, when it comes to that security that I talked about earlier, even customer experience, um, AI is taking on um, more opportunities. It's creating more opportunities to, um, you know, create value. And how organizations price it, um, embedded within their platforms, embedded within their solutions, and then how they price it um, is going to be an interesting interesting uh, uh you know change uh, we nobody can say today that there is an emerging model for pricing of ai i mean we've seen with chat gpt for example a freemium model at first yeah. but then you know uh, extra charge for um you know premium features um that they they introduced um now that on its own is kind of an independent uh product on its own but if you think about um enterprise uh, platforms if you think about enterprise software you know how they enable uh their platforms with uh ai solutions how they charge for that is going to be an interesting trend an interesting yeah. uh, change uh within the marketplace so that would be one um I would say second one is, and this has been this has been some years in making, uh, but we see that with the changing uh, uh, um, workforce, the the change of generation in the workforce and organization is bringing along opportunities for more technology enabled um, um, workforce and therefore uh, business uh, business solutions, and large by and large. The biggest opportunity to do that is through what we call low-code, no-code platform development. And so many of the platforms, if not all of them, uh, enterprise platforms, now have a uh, capability for uh, employees to uh, create solutions that they need in their very specific uh, area of work, but that integrates with the end-to-end -end process and end-to-end -end data model of the organization. And so if you think about, uh, you know, how most of the vendors price this today, um, again, there is opportunity for disproportionate value creation if 
um, or if you structure, if our clients structure uh, the right, uh, identify the right opportunities and uh, structure the right uh, pricing uh, pricing models with the vendors. Mm -hmm. um, and then that goes back uh, into the discussion around, you know, rationalization of uh, applications uh, and technology landscape, because uh, by, by now uh, moving some of those capabilities into the end-to-end -end enterprise platforms, you're kind of amplifying value, leveraging skills, that you have and uh, which drives obviously the opportunity to create more value from a software investment that's being made. So that will be the second one. Um, and the third one is kind of more on the, you know, connection uh, between the vendors and the clients and Grima mentioned that as a, one of the insights, uh, but we definitely see um, improvement in how uh, software vendors are able to provide telemetry around consumption uh, mm. of their of their softwares and create a different uh, ability to create different pricing model uh, depending on what's what any given client needs and so that creates more flexibility for them in terms of how to price but also for a clients uh, to create the right solutions as we discussed earlier so i would say these three uh these three trends together are creating really dynamic and uh, uh, environment full of opportunity to create more value and to think ahead in terms of what is the impact of what we have as a client and how do we create strategy to deal with this and get most value as we go forward. And I'm sure there is a, a cottage industry emerging that's uh, focused on helping organizations figure out and consolidate and present insights. And I'm sure there are also organizations that are there to help our clients figure out how to really orchestrate all of this so that, you know, that to, to, to really sort of maximize the value across the full portfolio of all software that they have. Um, I know that part of the report actually introduces a framework, framework that can be used to think about how to actually approach pricing, software pricing discussions and software models. So Garima, can you enlighten us on this? Sure. So um, this is um, a part of our work was also to help think soft, help software vendors think mm -hmm. about, okay, we, we, are, we are talking so much about this pricing model, but is there like a framework which they could use to help them make these decisions? Mm -hmm. And based on our research and experience, we, identif we have identified four key drivers which they need to evaluate and look at as they are thinking about pricing their existing or new product. Mm -hmm. So, so namely being customer competition, product value, and macro trends. Mm -hmm. So talking about customers. So it's important for software vendors to ask their customer what they want. That should be a key input into the pricing model decisions. Recognizing preference may vary by organization size, industry, and technology maturity. So, and the second one is on the competitor. So, of course, evaluating what your comp competitors are offering will help validate if a specific model works or not. At the same time, one should not really assume that whatever com competitors are doing, they have really got it right. There is always a scope for new and innovative pricing model, which could be a differentiator, and, speci and specifically for innovative products, which are like which for which the software vendor is, let's say, first to the market. In that case, typically there would be an, there'll be no competitor. So that's where you have like more flexibility in terms of how do you really set, really mold the customer in terms of a certain pricing model. The third key driver is product value. Mm -hmm. So understanding how your customer derive value from the product. And Dan spoke in length earlier that this is a very important aspect which software van vendors need to really evaluate like understanding how the value is derived from the product. So it could be from a specific transaction, example, per GB of data storage used, or through just having access to your software, the way it works for Microsoft Office, where we are not really driving value from a certain transaction. It's a culmination of everything together uh, that's providing value to the customer. And this product value becomes, this piece becomes more pertinent for consumption-based pricing, where that particular pricing model is only applicable when a clear value metric exists. Yeah. Of course, that is measurable, predictable, and scalable. Yeah. And incentivizing the right behavior. And the last um, 
key key decision maker, um, key decision driver on this is macro trends. So keeping a tab on what's happening in the market and is if there is a particular uh, particular macro event which might be nudging the product to a particular model. So for example, per cust uh, per customer call pricing is done for some of those customer care center products. And which might not be appropriate if there's a growing desire to reduce call with the chatbots or through the various technologies. So in that case, that particular pricing model might be actually help uh, making you lose money. Yeah, yeah. So we believe like all these factors, uh, if software companies use these factors as an input into the decision making, they would be in a better position to achieve their business outcomes. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, there are two uh, players in this dance. There are software manufacturers who are trying to maximize their value. And then there is a client who is trying to maximize their value. So may maybe what we can do is in the next couple of slides, if we can maybe zoom into what would be sort of the call for action advice for the buyer side first, perhaps. So maybe, maybe then we can go there. Um, yeah. Um, absolutely. Um, just to make sure that, uh, we lost you, Dalibor, I think, um, uh, are we still good connection? I, we're back. I'm back. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, I mean, to your point, um, absolutely two different, uh, two different, two sides to the story yeah. and hence, uh, the opportunity to actually work together much more closely, uh, to align um, uh, success outcomes across the board and, um, you know, ideally, in an ideal situation, uh, create that win-win uh, across, win-win uh, for everybody. And so, you know, in, in terms of kind of being decision maker and kind of thinking through being, be looking at the next software purchase or managing portfolio of, uh, of applications and kind of thinking through it, there are, you know, two or three things that come to mind. Um, all of them we, we talked about earlier, but maybe I'll just summarize them um, yeah. we, as we kind of get to this point of a call. Uh, but understanding the particular, the problem you're trying to solve, you know, and the nature of the value that gets created um, in, in a particular space would, would, would probably be a smart thing to look at that and, and, and understand the pricing model and initial take of do they align? You know, does our pricing model in terms of how we're going to be paying for technology, amongst other things, um, uh, align to how we're going to be creating value? So that would be one um, initial initial um, kind of view. Second one would be, you know, try to um, leverage uh, technology solutions to the fullest of their extent. You know, mm -hmm. uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the call, you know, I've been in this business now for over 20 years. And I've seen many, many situations where clients overbuy different solutions, creating this convoluted, complex, uh, oftentimes redundant, uh, you know, uh, landscape of technology. And I would say that's in addition to the pricing model, uh, understanding that landscape, you know, try to kind of rationalize it, try to create meaningful, strategic you know, um, uh, platforms for for future growth of the business, um, you know, would be the second uh, second uh, tip. And in that context, you know, creating strategic relationships with the ecosystem that uh, evolves around your business, um, particularly when it comes to technology or advisory and uh, business transformation type of partners that you have, uh, understanding the ecosystem and everybody's role in it and and value that they can bring to you and uh, how does it work together to simplify your business? Absolutely would be a second, um, you know, opportunity for buyers. Um, and then finally, number three, uh, we talked about how change and how uh, software vendors are approaching this are creating opportunities um, to, uh, uh, to, 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 to um, work better, to align better to value. Um, so, you know, be engaged. Um, don't uh, don't just do this, uh, you know, once and done. Um, th this is opportunity, I think, to create, as, as I mentioned, these strategic relationships, but do it on a regular basis um, so that you can benefit. The buyers can benefit from better understanding of opportunities available to them. Uh, they're changing business needs uh, and uh, changing market environment. Uh, and all of those, at the end of the day, can influence the conversations and 
um, help uh, you know, select or shift into a, select the right or shift into a, a better pricing model uh, over time. So yeah. uh, I, would, I would leave it there. Excellent. So the last the last message there is assume there is flexibility. If you don't ask, you will not get anything right. So be, be comfortable to ask, be comfortable to engage, be comfortable to talk about longer term partnership arrangements, especially for large ticket items. Right. Uh, that's excellent. Um, now, Similarly, because the report actually is is used for both sides, um, maybe some some perspective. Can we maybe go there as before we wrap up? No, sounds good. So, um, for the software companies, um, based on our research, we believe there are three major takeaways, three call to action, as I can say. So first one is le leveraging the decision framework, which we have um, we have illustrated in our report. Uh, that decision framework uh, will help you align, will help the software vendors align the right pricing model to the product, and at the same time making sure that they are aligning with their customer needs and preferences. Uh, the second one is on making consumption-based pricing more predictable. So if consumption-based pricing is the answer to your product. Consider how would you make usage and spend more predictable to your customers, because that's one of the major feedback which we heard from them. And review your subscription management process, how you are uh, helping your customers manage the end-to-end -end process. Are you making it simple? Are you making it transparent for them? And even consider providing billing model optionality for them. And um, lastly on this is on the same note on being more transparent, provide real-time insights. Mm -hmm. Try to be a transparent vendor, transparent and trustworthy vendor in the market by providing real-time usage insights on who is using your product uh, to your customers. So showing them who is using, when the product is being used, where is it used, how much is it used, will help you build that trust with your uh, with your customers and help you be a strategic partner to them in in their digital transformation journeys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Th this is excellent. This is excellent. I'm going to uh, then let, let you wrap up um, in a moment. Um, this is actually very important because, as I mentioned, when we talk to CIOs, top two items on their budget is people and software. And we know the amount of complexity, especially in this particular moment in time with you know, the certain economic uncertainties where people are looking for ways to save some money while increasing value, this certainly is, I think, an area that requires further investigation. Thank you very much, uh, Garima, for sharing your insights. Then I'm going to invite you to to sort of close us off, to wrap, wrap, wrap us up. as and, and then I'm going to, of course, announce what will, will be our next session about next week. Perfect. And thank you, Dalibor, again, for inviting us to the call. We felt there's a value in sharing some of this research with a broader audience. Absolutely. Um, and as you mentioned, I would say call to action here would be to, to you know, this is a topic that's been brewing in the marketplace for many, many years. Yes. Technology around how we manage these types of uh, uh, cost issues has evolved. Um, and um, to the point where now, uh, organizations should have much better visibility and, um, you know, opportunity to uh, perform and do some of these things that we discussed, align better, uh, you know, the value uh, story and value they're creating to kind of technology landscape that they're using. And so, uh, and the added urgency of the current, you know, market and, uh, you know, uh, economy and situation economy I think all of that is driving the the necessity for look at, for look at, looking more deeply into these things, and I will you know in addition to all of that, if you think about the future and where organizations are going to be headed in the future in terms of even broader adoption of technology enablement of their business, having and starting to clean up the legacy mm, that's yeah. been built up over the years, and be strategic in this way about the future, it's yet another, uh, you know, uh, catalyst uh, that could help drive this conversation out in a different way. So 
Uh, thank you again, and thanks everybody that joined. And um, Dalibor, you will share the report and happy to engage in any other follow-ups or questions if there are any. Of course. Thank you very much for that. Obviously, this is the topic for the time. So, and and excellent. I really want to thank you very much for 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 investing in the reports, and uh, I look forward to sharing it with our, with our audiences. And for those of you who are regulars, um, next week, next Wednesday on October twenty. Fifth, um, we're going to go back to our CIO interviews. So, um, as part of our conversations with tech leaders shaping the future of Canada series, and I'll be hosting Chadi Habib, who is truly a luminary of Canadian tech leadership and tech executive community. Uh, Shadi has a long, illustrious career, starting with EDS, then going to SAP, then being a CIO with Rio Tinto. Afterwards, he was a CIO with. Desjardins, then executive vice president with CGI, and now is a chief technology officer and head of business solutions for WSP, which is one of the largest professional services firms in the world, engineering professional services firms in the world, that's actually headquartered in Canada, in, in Montreal. So please join me next week to have a with, with a chat with Chadi Habib. And again, Garima and then thank you so much for your time. Thank you, audience, and have yourselves a lovely Wednesday. All the best. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye.